Welcome to Sharing Our Knowledge Conference. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Miss Ellen Carries? Carly. Carly? Miss Ellen Carly. You'll have to forgive me. I have to wear these glasses. I still can't. Okay, so she is on the results from the Chilkat Dye Project. Nice. Very good. Okay. From 2018 to 2024, the Jill Cat Dye Project was a collaborative among weavers and chemists and museum professionals. This presentation will describe dyes found on historic weaving in the Alaska State Museum and the Sheldon Jackson Museum collections and discuss project results, collaborative, pro, I don't know what that means, process and how the findings should be shared. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I see people are still coming in. But I'll uh, kind of get going here. Um, I'm Ellen Carley, the conservator at the Alaska State Museum in Juneau. As you might know, the Sheldon Jackson Museum here in Sitka is also part of the Alaska State Museums. I'm so lucky and grateful to live and work on Thinket Ani, on the Clinket land of the Aquan people in Zantikahini. I'm not native, my ancestors are European, and I grew up in Wisconsin. I've been in Juneau doing museum work since 2001. Today I'm sharing with you some preliminary analytical results from the Chilkat Dye Project. Back in 2018, when Liana Wallace was on staff, she had a vision to be collaboratively dyeing wool and studying the historic dyes in Chilkat textiles. When an opportunity arose to have analysis done by chemists at Portland State University, the Chilkat Dye Project was born. The group of weavers who collaborated within the museum have been known as the Chilkat Dye Working Group and here's our statement of purpose. First, to make space for dialogue among weavers, museums, and other kinds of experts about Chilkat weaving technology and meaning. Two, to better understand the dye innovations of past Chilkat weavers. Three, to enhance dye choices and creative control for the benefit of future and living weavers. Four, to celebrate the people, past and present and future, who make and use Chilkat weavings and five, to create a model of research that foregrounds the priorities of indigenous people through a network of long-term relationships. Here I've listed the names of the people on my email list who've come to at least one of the meetings of the Chilkat Dye Working Group. We've met more than 25 times, usually on one Saturday a month, starting with discussion and sharing over coffee and snacks in the classroom, followed by studying a robe together in the conservation lab. A few times, we've also gathered plants and done dyeing together back on the loading dock. I've got a few names down here in a blue rectangle, and those are the folks who are far away or have passed on, but whose work we've leaned on and credited in our research. The chemists who characterize the dyes are at Portland State University. Dr. Tammy lassiter Clare is the head of the lab and secured funding from the Mellon Foundation to do the analysis. And Dario Durastanti was the graduate student who did his PhD research on getting as much information as possible from each tiny sample. The title of his dissertation is Developing a Sample Efficient Analytical Pathway for a Qualitative Chemical Investigation of Ancestral Chilkat Dyeing and Weaving Practices. The Alaska State Museum is also a partner in this work, and the Chilkat Dye Project was featured in the 2021 exhibition, The Spirit Wraps Around You, Northern Northwest Coast Textiles. In order for the chemists to do their analysis, we made or found reference samples, which were part of the exhibit. Natural undyed wool, yellows, blacks and browns, 
and blue-greens. With only three color groups to review, how hard could it be? <laughs> Much harder than we anticipated. We sent 193 reference samples to Portland. Some of these we made ourselves, and some came from other places. The image on the left shows dye samples of Hudson Bay tea from Marcia Steyer, who took a dye class with Cheryl Samuel in 2002. We sent 121 yellows. Yellows were pretty easy to make. 36 blue-greens, much harder to make. 15 brown or blacks, and 21 plain samples. I'll explain why we sent undyed samples in a moment. Then we sent 117 historic samples, guided by the location of excess yarn that was needled up on the backs of the textiles, as guided by the weavers. This amounts to a couple of eyelashes worth of fiber in each historic sample. We sent 44 yellow, 32 blue, 35 black, and six plain samples. Besides the dye, there are a lot of other substances in our samples, both the references and the historic samples. And that's why the plain yarns were sent to try to subtract out more data in order to understand what we were seeing. So there are mordants that help um, the dye bite onto the fiber. And the dyes are different from paints. Paints usually have like a glue or a physical binder. But dyes need mordants to help make a chemical bond between the dye and the fiber. There's things in the water. There are soaps like Fels naphtha and other substances that scour the wool clean. There's pH alter altering things like baking soda or vinegar to make the dye bath alkaline or acidic. That changes the color. Perfumes, cosmetics, and hand lotions were found in the samples. Food residues, oils from people's hands, lanolin from the wool, soiling and dust, pesticides, and in the end, there's a derivatizing agent that the chemists use to help break up the molecules properly. So this all makes a lot of data. But here's some of our findings and insights from the historic weavings. Most of the yellows were natural. Almost half of the historic samples of yellow were from plants, and a third were from lichen, most likely wolf moss, which is really a lichen. Finding so much wolf lichen was exciting because it's written in historic accounts and it's part of the oral knowledge. Weavers still use it today. Our research in Juneau proved many good plant yellows are in our rainforest, but wolf lichen does not grow in our rainforest. It grows in the drier regions bordering the rainforest, including in Canada and down in Washington State and Oregon. So why wolf lichen? Some of the findings that the dye group talked about were that lichens are their own mordant. You don't need anything extra to bond the dye to the fiber. Lichens can be shelf-stable for decades, meaning you can dye on demand and not just when a certain plant is fresh. Lichens like wolf moss may be insect repellent. The image on the left shows the white wool in the little circle has been preferentially eaten by moths compared to the surrounding yellow, the surrounding yellow dye. Wolf moss trade also connects cultural relationships, especially historic ones related to the origins of Chilkat weaving. For the blues and greens, weavers today make a minty green with copper and ammonia and vinegar. A copper pipe soaked in ammonia will make a Windex blue colored solution. If you dip a wool yarn in that, you get a dull blue-gray color. And if you dip that in vinegar, you get a lovely minty green. But yarns that are visually minty green on our historic samples did not have copper. On the right is some minty green fringe on the robe currently displayed in the Clan House exhibit at the Alaska State Museum in Juneau. And it was not a copper green, so that's still a mystery. Indigo, mentioned in the historic literature, can be soaked from trade cloth with urine, and we simulated that with chemicals in the museum lab. However, no indigo was found on our historic samples in either the Alaska State Museum or the Sheldon Jackson Museum. Other museums have found indigo on certain robes, but none of the robes we care for had it. Historically, over-dyeing synthetic blues with natural yellows was sometimes done to make turquoise. This occurred on some of the robes in our collection, but there are no overdyes with lichens on our samples. So when weavers adjusted the blue-green color, it was using plant yellows and not wolf lichen yellows. 
For the blacks and browns, weavers today still use hemlock bark, which gives a warm reddish brown. And weavers know if you dip that in the copper and ammonia dye bath I described in the last slide, you get a deep, rich, warm black. This also appears often on the historic samples. The image on the right shows Patty Fiorella's dye experiments with a wide range of barks from our area. Turns out the chemist found that western hemlock is very high in tannins among the tree barks, and that's good for dyeing. While we did not find copper in our blue-green historic samples, 10 textiles had a lot of copper in the blacks and browns. Iron was sometimes seen together when we saw copper. The chemists also noticed a trend in the historic samples that border areas often had natural dyes, while design areas were often made with synthetic dyes. Now I'm going to zip through the findings for each of the weavings in the museum collections. This is a robe at the Sheldon Jackson Museum here in Sitka, like, likely dating from the mid-1800s. For all the historic samples, I've listed the findings by color and used numbers and color dots to show the sample locations where we took fibers from the backs. Here, both of the yellows were likely wolf lichen, and urine seems to have been used as the mordant for the yellow in the design area. The blue-greens all had plant overdyes, but it was hard to characterize the blues. Small amounts of iron and copper were sometimes found. You'll see the black dyed areas are all disintegrating on this robe, which has occasionally been seen in other collections as well. Cheryl Samuel's book on Chilcat robes suggested this was high iron content in the dye, but the ke chemists found no iron in the blacks on this robe, and instead there was a very large amount of copper. This is also a very old robe at the Sheldon Jackson Museum from the collection of William Seward, so pre-1869. It's very faded. The yellows were lichen, probably wolf lichen, and one of the blue-greens had chromium, which is a mordant in commercial dyes. Two of the blacks were commercial, but one in the border was a natural hemlock and copper. This robe is on exhibit in the Sheldon Jackson Museum, and I couldn't get a better picture, I'm sorry. The yellow sample from the border was lichen and urine, and the blue-green was synthetic, and one of the blacks was hemlock bark and copper. Another black was a combination of a plant source and a synthetic source. This robe, currently on exhibit in the Clan House display in the museum in Juneau, had a yellow dye that we couldn't characterize. The blue-greens were a combination of natural flavonoid, that means a plant dye, and a synthetic aniline dye. This includes the minty green fringe that we assumed was made with a copper dye, but it turns out it was not. The design area black sample was a synthetic commercial dye, and the border black was a natural hemlock bark and copper. The yellows in this robe were natural flavonoids, meaning plant dyes. The blue-green sample was a synthetic aniline with a natural over dye, and the black was a combination of natural plant dye and a synthetic azo dye. You may also be wondering about the little s and z in parentheses. Fiber artists know that yarns can be twisted clockwise or counterclockwise, and this is referred to as s-twist and z-twist. Usually, commercial yarns come s-twist, but if a weaver spins yarn by hand, it's usually z-twist. So this is a hint about how much the weaver is making or altering the yarn. We see natural plant dyes in the yellows of this robe, including a combination of synthetic dyes with natural plant dyes in the border. The blue-greens are synthetic, and so is the black in the border. The chemists were unable to characterize the yellow dyes in this robe. Both the blue-greens were synthetic, and so were the blacks. This robe is very special, as we think it might be completely made from mountain goat wool. Many robes seem to have mountain goat warps, the vertical elements that are thigh spun with cedar bark, and commercial sheep wool wefts, but the texture and the drape of this robe suggest mountain goat throughout. The yellows seem to be wolf lichen, and the black sample was hemlock bark and copper, but the two blue-green samples were synthetic. The yellows in this robe are plant-based natural dyes. 
The chemical piece of most plants that makes dyes yellow is really similar from plant to plant. And chemicals that might help identify plant species are usually no longer present because they were not part of the dye bath. I like to think of this like if you know you have vitamin C, but you can't tell if it came from an orange or a lemon or a lime or a grapefruit. But in this particular row, both the yellow samples show data that link the dye to the brassica family of plants. This includes things like wild mustard and watercress. But it also includes a lot of our cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, kale, Brussels sprouts, and cabbage. But before we get too excited, I have to tell you that skunk cabbage, which we tested and it does make a really nice yellow, is not actually a cabbage and not related. The blue was a synthetic aniline dye with a natural yellow plant over dye, and the black was synthetic. The yellow from the border of this robe was a natural plant dye. Both the blue-green and the black were likely synthetic. It's worth mentioning that while there was a trend in our research that found more consistent use of natural dyes in the border areas than in the design areas, we didn't see that coming, and we didn't always sample yellows and blacks from both the border and the design field. We only sampled both if it was obvious they were visually different. The yellows of this robe are made from natural plant dyes, while the blue-green and the black are synthetic. This robe was made by Jenny Clenot around 1948 and might be the most recently made of the weavings we studied. The yellows were natural plant dyes, sometimes combined with synthetic dyes. The blue-greens and blacks were also synthetic dyes, so possibly commercial yarns. Those were also the findings for this robe by Jenny Clenot at the Sheldon Jackson Museum made about 10 years earlier. Natural plant dye was used for the yellow and synthetic dyes on the blue, green, and black. This weaving is quite small, a little more than a foot across. Acquired by the museum before 1930, the yellow in the border was synthetic, which was surprising because of how faded it is. The black border was also synthetic, and the chemists were unable to characterize the blue. This is another small weaving made with natural plant dyes for the yellows and synthetic dyes for the blue and black. This weaving came into the museum collection before 1926. This small weaving was collected by a couple on their honeymoon in Haines in 1926. Both the yellow samples were made from natural plant dye and the black is synthetic. This is a very small weaving, maybe even a legging. It came into the museum collection sometime before 1925. While there are at least three visually different yellow yarns, all of them are made from various natural plant dyes. The blue is an unknown dye. The design area black is synthetic, and the border area black is made from natural hemlock bark and copper. This cut fragment from the border of a Chilkat robe was part of a 1977 auction of items from Ye Old Curiosity Shop in Seattle. This might also be an example of a weaving fully made from mountain goat wool. I'll also point out how much cedar bark is in the warp. Older robes have warps that are mainly made of cedar bark with a small amount of wool, while more contemporary weavings today usually have warps predominantly made of wool and only a little bit of bark. This robe is with the upper edge made of painted leather and the sides made from fragments of Chilkat robes. Museum records suggest it came from the Jack Newton collection at the Curio Shop in Sitka in the 1920s or 30s, and the museum purchased it from a collector in 1977. Sometime before it entered the museum collection, it was treated with arsenic as a pesticide. Almost all the dyes are synthetic, except for some natural plant dye in combination with a synthetic dye in the blue-green sample. There was a lot of variation in the visual appearance of the blacks, and they were all different dyes, but all of them were synthetic. This beautiful vest was made from fragments of at least two different Chilkat robes. The back is made from a piece of dark blue wool trade blanket. It's currently on exhibit at the Sheldon Jackson Museum here in Sitka. The yellow seemed to be wolf lichen, 
and the three different blue-greens are all synthetic dyes. And the black border we sampled was natural hemlock bark with copper. This amazing garment is in storage at the Sheldon Jackson Museum, and I was unable to get a very good image of it because it's very delicate and actively losing beads. This is a shirt, and you can see the red wool sleeves have severe moth damage, and the black wool areas with beadwork also have old insect damage. The central torso region is made from ceremonially cut fragments of Chilkat robes, and you'll see the fringe area only exists today because the warp was mainly cedar bark. All the undyed wool on the fringe has been devoured by moths. This is an excellent example of how insects will preferentially avoid certain dyes. The white wool yarn areas are the most damaged, followed by the blue, which was not fully identified, but includes a natural plant dye. The blacks are not impacted much by insect damage, which may be due to the copper content of that dye. The black border was a combination of a natural plant dye and copper, and both the yellow samples were wolf lichen, one of them mordanted with urine. The insects clearly avoided the yellow areas. And finally, we sampled yarns from a weaver's kit that was sold to the museum by Helen George of Klukwan in 1959. The kit included some unused wolf lichen. Two of the yellow balls of yarn were made from lichen, probably wolf lichen, and two were made from natural plant dyes, but one was unable to be characterized. Both of the blue-green samples were synthetic, one of which was identified as a synthetic triaryl methane dye called Brilliant Green. There were no black yarns in the kit. Some of the yarns are currently on exhibit in the Clan House display at the Alaska State Museum in Juneau. So here's a few additional insights. The rise of synthetic dyes, literally thousands of dyes were invented, happened during similar dates to the rise of the abundance of Chilkat weavings in the mid to late 1800s and early 1900s. So synthetic dyes were being incorporated into weavings all along, at least for the weavings in the Alaska State Museum and Sheldon Jackson Museum collections. Natural dyes were also being continuously used even when synthetic dyes were easy to get. Sometimes they were not easy to get. For example, during World War I, synthetic dyes were very hard to get because they were mainly manufactured in Germany. Discussions among the working group made clear that the dye choices have purposes beyond their visual appearance. So I want to emphasize that these chemical dye characterizations I'm sharing with you today are only part of the story. And I'm focused on that here for time limitations in the, in the interest of sharing with the community what the chemists found. In this slide, I mentioned the access, impacts, and sharing of our process and results so far. Lily Hope has for years been teaching natural dye classes at UAS in Juneau and made several videos on YouTube for making Chilkat dyes, particularly the copper ammonia technique for green, the wolf moss for yellow, and the hemlock bark for black. Lily's also presented in classrooms and at kids' dye workshops at the museum in 2019, 2021, and 2023. We introduced the project to the community at the 2019 Sharing Our Knowledge Conference in Juneau. Our efforts to develop a reference set were part of the Spirit Wraps Around You exhibit and catalog in 1921. Paige Sparks and KTOO did a half-hour documentary called Weaving Our Identity in 2022 about our collaboration, and that's also on YouTube. And we gave status reports at Celebration in 2022 and 2024. Portland State University sent Lily Hope and chemist Dario Durastante with me to the American Institute for Conservation Conference in Los Angeles in 2022 to present about the project. Here are some of the mysteries that we couldn't yet answer. For example, the literature mentions an iron-rich mud as a brown dye, but we were unable to source any. It also mentions the historical literature mentions blue clay, perhaps containing a dye from algae, but we haven't found that. Hidnellum mushrooms are said to give good blue or green dyes. Those grow in our area, and sometimes they're known as bleeding tooth fungus or strawberries and cream fungus. Chocolate lily, or northern rice root, is said to give blues and greens, and just this summer, Patty Fiorella shared with us a method to pull color from the flower using a salt method. The fiber disintegration problem we saw in one of the robes is not fully understood still. Plant species identification is challenging, but really interesting to weavers. 
how we get the most information out of a precious sample is ongoing. And uh, the question of what are the future analysis possibilities for communities who might want it. So those are some future directions. And the big reason that I'm here today is to ask the community how to share. What is the appropriate way to wrap up this collaborative research project? For example, the research results could simply be in the files at the museum with records about the weavings and, and in the database that's on the internet. There could be an academic publication or a less technical publication for broader audiences or both. There could be an online website with images like the ones that I shared today. Or maybe we could send those reference yarns around to schools and libraries through the hands-on program loaned out through the Sheldon Jackson Museum. We've been trying to come up with a balance in this collaboration between the way museums share, the way communities share, and the way chemists share. My priority is the way communities and weavers want this information shared. I've met twice with the Chilkat Dye Working Group about these results, twice with the chemist Dario, and I presented a version of this talk at Celebration in Juneau earlier this summer. I'll be here at the conference until Sunday night, so please come up to me with your feedback, your concerns, your corrections, any of that sort of stuff. This is my contact information if you want to um, ask for more information or if you want to give me for more feedback, ideas on sharing. And I also want to um, mention that I've just begun a beadwork collaboration. There are over 800 beaded items at the Alaska State Museum and over 300 at the Sheldon Jackson Museum. From a preservation perspective, I'm looking into crizzling, color damage, and bead attachment issues. But we also have a study group meeting monthly now to prioritize the research interests of bead workers. So connect with me if you want to be looped in on that collaborative project. Thank you. Yep. I'm just checking on an assumption I was making while you were talking that those old um, cloth that were dyed were much brighter when they were original. I mean, originally done, they were much brighter than that. There's been a lot of fading going on, is what I'm asking. I think it depends on what the robes have experienced. Like, a lot of natural dyes do fade, and a couple of the really early ones at the Sheldon Jackson Museum, like, the pictures almost look like they're black and white pictures. But um, it depends on how robes were cared for. It was um, pointed out to me by uh, Clinkett elders at one point that they didn't hang robes on the walls <laughs> uh, and display the way that you know museums and uh, non-native collectors did. Those robes were often folded up and kept in cedar boxes and whatnot. So um, the fading really relates strongly to the light exposure that the robes had over time. Um, I do, but I don't have it um, with me. Um, it has, uh, you know, the, the chemical in it, vulpinic acid. Um, so there's something vulpinic in, in it. Do you have the? Oh, oh, there you go. But in the vulpinic. So if I understand right, um, it was, had been used as a, a, a poison uh, for wolves, vul, vulpinic or vulpine coming like from a Latin term for wolves, if I'm not mistaken. And so the, that toxicity also, I think, goes over into keeping the moths and the bugs from eating the wool. And then what was the part used on the skunk cabbage? So uh, when we were trying to dye with skunk, skunk cabbage, I think we were um, using the leaves. And a lot of the things that we dyed with um, from the rainforest here give great yellows. Um, but we didn't find any skunk cabbage um, on any of the old robes. The, um, it was something from the brassica family, and we're not sure what plant they were dying with from the brassica family, but that finding was really exciting to weavers. So you, but you said you did do a project with skunk cabbage, and you used the leaves, and it <coughs> nice, you got a nice yellow. Yep. Cool. And I think, the, um, yeah, the, I wanted to try the, what is that part that sticks out the spath that comes up through the snow? Um, but most of the things we were experimenting with were giving yellows. And one more thing. Is yeah. the, there a lot of times it said that the lichen did use a urine hornet, but you were saying they don't. So do you know why sometimes they use the urine with the lichen and sometimes? Well, um, sometimes we were finding that in the, 
in the results, um, if you chat with Lily Hope, she's done a lot of work with this, and her finding was that if you use urine, you can really suck so much of the dye out of the lichen. It comes out of the dye bath like gray. It really works much faster. It also works with tap water it, or distilled water, rain water. Like you can get the dye out of the lichen either way, but you can get it out more efficiently with urine. Uh, you mentioned twining with uh, cedar bark, and I don't know if that has the, what you found about the twining with cedar bark and how well the robes have been preserved or how well the cedar bark twining protects the wool, or if there's any problem with it, because I know the oil in cedar bark is, you know, you, you can't put it down your drain. I mean, you have to dispose of it in, you know, on the ground somewhere. Right. Well, there's no doubt that the cedar bark in the robes helps a lot with the preservation because of, you know, what weavers knew about cedar being insect repellent and, yeah. and that yeah. sort of thing. And it that definitely has helped with the preservation of the robes a lot. But not everybody does that. Because you have to gather the cedar bark, and then you have to, it's a, such an involved process. Well, as far as I understand, almost all the Chilkat weavings have cedar bark and wool thigh spun as the warps. It's, it's really important to the technology of how they can get the um, twined and braided elements into the weaving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you touch on what the method was for getting blue-green out of the chocolate lily this summer? This just happened this summer, and it was quite the uh, amazing thing that um, Patty was showing us. She would just have um, salt, a certain ratio of the weight of the flour and the weight of salt. And then she just put on like a, a glove and just ground up, kind of macerated the flour with the salt, and it really got uh, blues and greens out of the flour in a way that um, like a simmering in a dye bath hadn't done. So it kind of opened our mind. I mean, there's other plants. Blues and greens are really hard to make. And even in cases where we had heard that we could get greens, for example, like young nettles are supposed to be able, we weren't able to get the colors that the references were saying we should. So now we feel like, wow, that maybe salt is a, a variable. There's so many variables in natural dyeing that you can play with, and that hadn't really been on our radar before. There is a salt method used with Japanese indigo, too, so that's interesting huh. for extracting it out of the fresh leaf. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You bring up a lot of thoughtfulness in this, and they thank you so much. And the blue clay, when we were younger, I said to throw this in there, in Wrangell over on Crittenden Creek, we go there and we chase um, humpies, and then your feet would get gushy in there and on the sides of the uh, whatever that is there, this is blue clay that oozes out of there, and it made me think of that when we were young. You could go like gushy, gushy your feet and hands in it, wow. and then wash it off in the creek. Yeah, it was a silvery blue. Wow. Yeah, and wrinkle and creek. And creek. Yeah, one interesting. <laughs> so, you know, I, I always wonder, I thought it was such a pretty color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, and then we had um, Miss Holly Burns come and she was dyeing grass for her baskets. And I wanted to watch and goes, Virginia, this is like a 300, uh, 300 year method. Get out of here. You know, <laughs> it was, yeah. you know they, they keep care of it, you know? Keep yeah. Care of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know that fermentation is sometimes used for natural dye baths, and I wondered if you had heard anything about fermentation being used in any of the dyes or had done any experiments with fermenting? Um, we hadn't fermented anything. There are some um, lichen dyes that apparently they soak um, the lichen in alkaline substances like ammonia for like months at a time sort of thing. Like the complexity of the options of what to try with natural dye are, are pretty epic, and I haven't tried um, fermentation methods. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering, Ellen, if this data has been crossed with any documentation about um, communities. So, has all of this data does it does it lead you toward any patterns of use of 
dying methods in certain communities? Like, does this map on to geography? Yeah, one of the things that's really frustrating is so few of these robes, do we know where they came from? And I feel like that's something that, um, you know, the weavers want to know where those robes came from. They want to know how old are these robes. There are like questions that we're hoping that this could lead to, but there's, you know, there's only a limited number of, of robes that and weavings that we were able to look at, and very few of them actually have a, a location. Yeah. You don't want to really take samples from robes a lot, do you? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm sure people want lunch and they're getting hungry, so I'll let you go, but um, I'm here the rest of the conference, love to chat. That's my email, thank you.